Uh, so really good to be here. I'm from uh, Tokyo, which is like, uh, I guess like the Singapore of the North, very clean city, but we don't have all that <laughs> ethnic diversity and inexpensive delicious food. So, um, but it's really good to be here and uh, see you guys. Today I'm going to talk about markup and style without CSS, HTML and CSS. So uh, this is where I am on Twitter. Uh, that's where I am on the web. Uh, that is where I am on email, and you'll notice that it's actually, uh, it describes my actual profession until this year. Uh, actually, uh, this is the first year I've actually coded for a living. Uh, until then, I was just doing uh, hobby stuff, so my flavor's a little bit weird. Um, so I started in 2004 as a translator, and then uh, uh, ja for, of Japanese. Uh, and so uh, the next year, I was, I was a translator, and then the year after that, and uh, kind of career, let's just get going and finally <laughs> this year I quit I was like screw that I'm doing JavaScript um, and so uh, one of my first projects thank you <laughs> oh. one of my first projects you might have seen it was called 140 bytes uh, and it was a like a community curated collection of JavaScripts that could fit in a tweet uh, literally like 140 characters uh, and so uh, we had some really, really crazy entries. We put up a website to showcase all of them. Uh, I'm going to give you my top three. Can someone tell me what this does? <laughs> it parses Roman numerals. Uh, how about this one? <laughs> it draws Mandelbrot. How about this one? Bam! Sudoku solver! <laughs> That blew my mind, the Sudoku solver, by the way. I wish I had a t-shirt to give you, but um, I'll keep, maybe I'll give you this shirt later or something. Um, people uh, are, have a lot of free time, uh, and w I learned a lot about JavaScript. This Sudoku solver, in, in particular, is, is crazy interesting because, I don't know if you can tell, but on the second line, there's a capital A, so it's I minus minus or capital A. You'll notice that A is, no, is not even declared in there. Uh, what that A does is it actually throws an error because it's an uh, undefined reference. And so <laughs> the way you solve it, you have to actually wrap the Sudoku solver in a try-catch loop. Um, so uh, yeah, some crazy creativity there. Uh, the project I did this year was called Browserver. And I was actually going to talk about Browserver here, but I decided not to because I have another project. Uh, Browserver was kind of cool. It was a Node.js server in your browser. So it was basically HTTP over WebSockets. So I HTTP'd all the things. Uh, I was like, well, why don't we just speak HTTP everywhere? Like, instead of having HTTP, because if you do Node, like I do, everything is like HTTP, and then only your browser connection is either, is, is if you want to do real-time stuff, you can't really use HTTP because there's no way to push stuff to the client. So I was like, well, why don't we just proxy it over WebSockets? So a browser, then you can go to the site. It's browserver.org. Browser connects to the server, gets a host name. The server passes all the HTTP in, and it, it then proxies all the HTTP out so that the browser becomes a server. So it's basically, if you code Node, you probably see this code all the time. It's like the hello world of Node, like getting HTTP requests in and sending them out. But you've never seen that in the browser. Um, and so that was really cool, and that was called Browserver. Uh, and the site itself uses Browserver. You can see as people go to the site, you can see uh, the count go up, and there's all the cool stuff you can do with it. But anyway, that was kind of a fun project. Uh, but there was a blog post um, this year that was a wake-up call for me. Um, it was by Paul Irish, who, of course, we all know and love. Uh, it was about how... Um, we are competing, as people who know JavaScript, we're competing with other ecosystems that are succeeding in ways that JavaScript is not. Uh, because we're at a kind of a disadvantage uh, in that we don't have this like ironclad, uh, you know, vertical ecosystem. Uh, it's much more open, much more free. Uh, and so while that's an advantage in terms of diversity and evolution, it actually makes development a little bit harder. And so I think there needs to be a visceral feeling that, you know, we want the platform that we develop on, HTML, CSS, JavaScript to survive. Um, I don't, I, I'm sick of getting my friends asking me to build them an app and having to explain to them, well, HTML5 and all this, they don't want to hear that. They just want an app in the, in the app store. So um, I really want to uh, really focus on uh, making web app development more compelling, by which I mean, how can we make it easier and how can we make it faster? Uh, and so what I did is I took a look at the stack that we use uh, to develop web apps. So there's no surprises here. JavaScript, HTML, CSS, this is what we use. Um, you know, we're competing against people who build in only one language. They don't need to know three, they only need to know one. And that could be a different language, who knows, while we have these three. So to me, it's a little bit of overhead. But the thing about HTML and CSS is that they are the best slash worst slash best again thing about the web. So um, they've been awesome. They're just like, they're, 
it's really easy to get into JavaScript because you're starting with these languages that are really easy to grok because they're declarative, because you know you can just read them on one page and everything's open source on the web. You just view source. Um, so they're they're awesome because they're standard. You know, you've got these HTML5 standard. You've got the you know CSS. So we want to keep them around. They're declarative, which is really easy. Uh, declarative just means that like literally you declare it, and there's you don't describe how the flow happens. You just describe like what it is, uh, and you let the browser interpret it. So if you look at uh, Wikipedia for declarative programming, it'll say right here. Um, so HTML uh, is a is considered declarative. I would consider CSS the same. So that's really cool. So we're, we're declarative. Um, but uh, HTML and CSS, unfortunately, are not JavaScript. Uh, and if you're like me, you have a golden hammer. Uh, you want everything to be in JavaScript. Um, I'm actually just kidding. What I mean by they're not JavaScript is that they're not dynamic. Um, so you write them once, and then that's it. It's a string. You can't do anything with it. Um, and so what happens is, Instead of people, instead of using CSS, the problem with CSS is that it's not powerful enough. I think. Uh, and so what do we do? Well, we pre-process things, right? So a lot of people are not really writing CSS so much anymore. They're writing languages that then write CSS. Uh, because if you want any of these things, you cannot use CSS. You have to pre-process your code, right? So we see people using things like SAS. We see people thing using things like less. Um, and those are great. But um, uh, you know, so actually, let me go back to the uh, the left side. This is what. So, in case you're just wondering what people, if you don't use these things, what people are actually looking for. And uh, hey, oh wow, this is this is an exercise. Hey, guy. <laughs> um, wow. Okay, this is testing my hand-eye coordination here. Um, this is what people want. People want, you know, they want uh, functions. They want, uh, they want to be able to nest uh, styles. They want to be able to do all this stuff that's dynamic, uh, and they want to be able to do it in their styles. So anyway, the problem with that is, well, first of all, um, I don't know if you've seen this by Leah Vru, uh, prefix free. Um, that's on the server. So even if you're using stuff like less or SAS, you're still shipping all of these uh, vendor prefix things for browsers that don't care. So we end up sending a lot of bloat on the wire, uh, and there's still not a lot of, I'm not satisfied with uh, those tools just yet. HTML is the same thing. I don't think HTML is powerful enough in terms of if you want to build like a dynamic app. So what do we do? We don't build HTML. We don't write HTML. We write templates. Uh, and if you look at, for example, NPM, which is the repository for all the node modules, there are 18,000 modules right now, and there are a there are a thousand of them that just do templates. So that's like uh, okay. I feel like it's like Star Wars. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of template <laughs> engines, and. Uh, I am just as guilty of, of contributing to that. Uh, I've written a lot of my, sh my own share of template engines. I wrote one in 140 bytes. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And it uses all sorts of evil stuff like the function constructor and with and uh, all these things. Um, I actually, my first open source module uh, ever was, um, was a, a port of uh, John Resig's microtemplating for Node, but right when Node came out. Uh, and so, you know, this is the John, this is John Resig um, micro templates. This is like the granddaddy of all JavaScript templates. Uh, people these days, probably, if you're using stuff like Backbone, uh, uh, you're using underscore, which has its own template system built in. Um, so that's the popular, that's a really popular choice. Um, people also use Mustache, uh, which is a big one. Uh, mustache is cool because it's in all sorts of languages, and they call it logicless templates. So I don't know about you, but that to me is logic. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, it, you can't pull logic out of templates. If you pull all the logic out of templates, then they're not really useful anymore, I think. Uh, and so, um, so, you have, uh, so even if you decide to use something like a mustache, um, what you do is, as Eric was talking about earlier, you do a hack like this, where you have a script with a type that isn't recognized, and you can just dump your template in there. Uh, and to me, this, it reminds me of, uh, of do you guys remember, uh, th this is like a uh, kind of a big blog post in 2002, as actually before I was coding, but um, to me, obtrusive JavaScript uh, now is, a, the HTML is obtrusive. Now that we're building apps that are like JavaScript first and HTML second, like the HTML starts to be obtrusive. And so this is what I really see when I see templates. So for example, um, if you do the strategy of injecting that script in the, your document, now you have to go to that script element, you have to find it. You have to pull out its inner HTML to get the script source. Uh, then you have to run that through a function to create a function. Uh, and then you have to give that function an object of your data to create an HTML string, which you then pass to jQuery to create a DOM object which is like crazy, the fact that we put up with this. It's like, uh, that's a lot of work. Um, and that's not even enough because, well, I mean, well, you could just you could keep using that. And that's, I mean, I, this is what I use when I, when I uh, build stuff. And, but what about stuff like this? Do you, get, does you guys, uh, have you heard of uh, Chrome apps, the uh, packaged apps? 
coming up. Um, it's kind of, it hasn't really, it's, I don't think it's actually officially launched necessarily yet, but it's crazy cool. Uh, you can build all sorts of cool stuff using Chrome, and they're putting all sorts of new APIs in it, like you can have a TCP server in your browser, uh, and all sorts of cool stuff. But if you look at package apps, and this is, I think, going to be a very big platform right up there with Firefox OS, uh, you have to comply with CSP, which is their content security policy which is really boring, but basically says uh, you can't use the function constructor. OK, well, guess what? All of your template engines use the function constructor. So you're not going to be able to use any of your template engines unless you're using some sort of sandboxing thing, and then your code is just that much more complicated. So anyway, so we have these three languages, but not really because we don't actually code in these three languages. We code in these three languages, right? OK, so well, that's great. So all we've really done by coding in these almost languages is that we've just switched these two which to me is a step backwards. Uh, so here's what I want. Uh, I don't want this, I want this. Okay, so to TLDR, if I could sum it up in one sentence, let us kill CSS and HTML and resurrect them in JavaScript. Okay, so this is, this is the thesis here, okay? So in, less, in, in a less wide combinator hacker news flame baity way, I would say let's port CSS and HTML to the syntax of JavaScript. Okay, so this ba basically, JavaScript, obviously, very dynamic. Uh, now, why don't we just write these things that we use in these other serialized languages using JavaScript? And I've done that, and it's called Domo. OK, so this is what I'm going to talk about. This is my library, Domo. Uh, so Domo is markup, style, and code in one language. And that language happens to be JavaScript. So it's right here if you want to check it out. Uh, make sure you look at the source and go to GitHub. Uh, and you know what? It's not big. It is, uh, it's like 1.3K uh, mini-zipped. So it's not like a big commitment. It doesn't do a lot of things. All it does is create DOM. That's all it does. You can still use it with jQuery. You can use it with Backbone. You can use it whatever you're using now. But in the, t in, in the part that you're creating DOM, it just fills that. So instead of using templates or CSS preprocessors, you're using, you're using this. So you can do all this stuff in one language with JavaScript syntax. So what we do is instead of creating templates that, that do output HTML and then turning that into DOM, uh, we just code straight to the DOM. So instead of coding CSS uh, and then you know, putting that in a script tag and having that be uh, parsed into a style sheet, we just code style directly. So basically the big switch for the, the way that y'all might be used to doing apps is basically this. So instead of having JavaScript that creates HTML and then that HTML then gets converted into DOM, you just turn these two things around. Does that make sense? So you write JavaScript that creates DOM. If you want HTML, which you need less and less, but you still maybe need it for the server, you can just call inner HTML or outer HTML on the DOM that you create and then ship that down. Does that make sense? But DOM is first. So we're targeting the DOM, not HTML. So, uh, so I put that out there, you know, Hacker News, whatever. Uh, and uh, I got uh, all sorts of feedback. I got really incredible, just awesome, just really helpful feedback from all sorts of interesting people. Um, this guy, I don't know if you've heard of him, uh, he's speaking at this conference or whatever. Uh, so uh, yeah, so you'll get to hear his, uh, his take on, on things. Um, very, very smart dude, very smart dude. Uh, so to get that was like, wow. But I <laughs> thought this tweet was so much awesomer because it was followed by this tweet. Any sufficiently advanced JavaScript framework is indistinguishable from parity. <laughs> oh, that made my day. Uh, and you know, this is not a new idea uh, of you know, kind of unifying in one syntax. Uh, you guys remember why uh, he did this with Markaby, uh, not with CSS, but more with HTML and Ruby. So it's like you're writing Ruby, but it looks like HTML. Uh, there is in languages like uh, Clojure, this is a big thing because Clojure itself is a homo iconic language. So like Clojure itself looks like markup. You're basically, it's a recursive tree of things. And so that's, our HTML is a recursive tree of things. So it maps really, really well. And so this approach is actually not necessarily new. Um, but uh, I have uh, added my flavor to it. So how does it actually work? Here's how it works. Uh, you start with HTML, okay? So who here knows HTML? <laughs> who here hates it when speakers ask you to raise your hand? Yeah, 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 I hate that. I can't hear you, what? Uh, don't do that. Um, anyway, so, uh, so that is HTML. All right, so, so HTML element, okay? Everyone knows an HTML element. It has, uh, it has three parts, okay? The first thing is it has a node name. In this case, it's an anchor tag, it's an A. Second thing it has, is it has a map of attributes. So in this case, there's only one attribute, it's href, and it has this string about .html. Uh, 
The third thing this has is child nodes, which is a list. This list is only one thing. It's a text node, and it is about. Okay. So that's HTML. So let's recreate that in JavaScript. Okay. So I have a function, domo element. Okay. So this is we're going we're gonna to start here. So there's you so you, you load domo. It's a, you know 1.3k, uh, and it has a, you know just puts a global domo object there, and it has an element function, and that element function takes three arguments. Super super easy. So this is how you would do that in domo. Now you'll notice this code sucks because it's really, really verbose. All right. So the idea is start with just the pure implementation. This is create. This is really, to me, it's very intuitive. Uh, but then let's sugar it up so that it looks more like HTML, so it's more comfortable. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is Domo has one function for each of the 110 HTML5 elements. Okay. Here they are. All right. So that's easy. So then instead of writing this, we can just write this. OK? All right. So that's the first step of sugaring this thing to make it easier. Well, actually, the about is an array. But as you know, JavaScript uh, can take a uh, variadic. It can be variadic. So you can actually pass n functions because there's an arguments uh, array-like thing. So you actually don't need that to be an array. Everything after the first uh, thing, the first thing is attributes. Everything after that it are the child nodes. Does that make sense? So that's like a little more noise we can take out of this. Um, and so this is cool. So now this thing that's like href about HTML, we don't we can just pull that out into a variable, right? And so we don't need anyone's permission. We don't need any uh, template language template language telling us what we can and can't do. It's just JavaScript. So you can do anything variables, anything. That whole uh, attributes object itself could be a variable. All the children could be a variable. That could just be a list that you map. Uh, like for example, one of the things you could do with this is if this had many things in it, you could just go like literally like uh, array dot map. Uh, you know, and then a function, and it'll be like li thing. So you just put all those things in li, right? So instead of using these like Franken symbols where everyone's basically recreating Perl in a templating language, uh, you can just use JavaScript. So I'm super, I'm a big fan of that. Okay, cool. So we pulled that out, uh, and now, um, yeah. So uh, so no, we can we can do stuff like that. Uh, and so let's actually have you noticed what, what changed between this code and this code? This is like a where's Waldo thing. So you'll notice that here's this like domo.a. So we're on the domo namespace. Here it's just a capital A. What is up with that? Just like every other job, just like every other JavaScript library using the client, domo auto pollutes. <laughs> it's it's convenient by default. This is by design, okay? It auto pollutes. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that it takes every of those 110 HTML5 elements, capitalizes them, and then pollutes the global object. Okay, which is horrible, but super, super sweet. Because then we can create things that look even more like HTML. All right, now here's the thing about this. It's actually optional, just like jQuery. When jQuery, you can call no conflict, like dollar sign equals jQuery dot no conflict, and then it actually unpollutes, and then you have a reference to the jQuery object, and you can do whatever you want with it, right? Domo has the same thing. It's called global. You can call it with false. It'll unpollute the global object, and then you can use Domo to assign things uh, as you'd like. Does that make sense? So convenient by default. All right, so now we can go a href blah blah blah, and actually this is really cool if you use ES6, which you're probably not using yet, or if you use something like CoffeeScript, because what that means is you can actually use destructuring. Does that make sense? So if you know what you're going to be using in a given template, you can just be like, well, I'm going to use the a tag and the div and whatever, and you can actually just assign those and just pull them straight off of the domo object, because this domo.global false returns the domo object. Okay, cool. So like for example, if you're using CoffeeScript. You can do something like this. We don't need vars anymore. We have uh, we have the destructuring, which is cool. Uh, and then on that a, we can actually make that even more coffee script uh, by taking out all of that uh, pesky syntax. Uh, and actually, we can even further coffee scriptify that by uh, restructuring. So uh, so the idea here is okay, cool. So now this is JavaScript. So instead of relying on some other template engine or some other dude to like implement sugaring and just choosing the thing that's the sweetest, we can just use JavaScript. And if you want it sweeter, if you want syntax sugar, you can just use another language. Just use CoffeeScript or use, I don't know, TypeScript or Iced CoffeeScript or whatever the language du jour is. Um, but the idea is it's your choice. So we've decoupled the sugar from the implementation, which I think is very, very important. So I'm actually using CoffeeScript because I think it's awesome for markup because it looks like Haml without all of the overhead of Haml. So if you look at the actual source of the Domo website, it looks like this. 
So I don't know if this makes any sense to you, but this is just, it's, yeah, it's basically just a nested, uh, you know, declaration of, so at the top we have, uh, that is a mix-in, we'll talk about that later, uh, and that, so the mix-in is just a function, and then we have just a nest. So like one thing we're doing that's cool is that style tag type text CSS, we're actually using uh, a list comprehension in CoffeeScript uh, to iterate all over those things, and we're using actually more comprehensions there. Uh, and so, you know, you can decide, you can not put logic in your templates, you can put logic in your templates, the point is it's your decision. So if you just want a function that takes one thing and you just call properties of that and there's no logic, your thing, awesome. If you want to put logic in your templates because e it's easier in your JavaScript already, then totally do that. Uh, but the point is that it's your choice. Meanwhile, on the server, so Domo works on the server too, which is weird because the server doesn't have a browser, so how does that work? Uh, well, it works like this. Um, there's something called uh, document.js, and all it does is it mimics a DOM, which actually, if you've, uh, has anyone ever used DOM libraries on the server? Like phantom.js or uh, JS DOM or anything like that, right? Okay, cool, so some people have. Uh, so you can actually mimic a browser on the server, and usually it's like crazy buggy. Um, but don't forget, we're not mimicking a browser. We just want HTML, right? Because that's the only thing we're putting. We just want to pull HTML out of this DOM. So actually, if you just want HTML, you can actually implement the, in the, like a good chunk of the DOM API and just Im implement outer HTML. And that'll just return the HTML for you. So I've actually implemented that and ship it with a Node version of Domo, and it's only 822 <laughs> bytes. It's actually not that hard. And so, I mean, forget the byte size, who cares, because it's Node, but the point is there's not a lot of code there. It's not a giant abstraction. So you just actually, we just provide you a browser shim so that if you want to generate server-side code, you can, right, HTML. So we do that. Actually, if you look at, this is the source for the build process for the uh, for Domo web page itself. Uh, we create our own document tag, right, because a document tag actually gives you the um, doc type, the HTML5 doc type, which is helpful. And yeah, just a bunch of scripts. Uh, this is really cool, uh, having a no script tag, and then you do a meta refresh. So if you don't have a, I love that hack, and apparently that's valid HTML5, so don't quote me on that. But um, yeah, so if you come and you don't have JavaScript, you just get redirected off, uh, which is cool. So those we can forget about those people. Um, go back to your cave. Uh, and so yeah, so uh, we can do that on the server or on the client. And so that is how you write HTML with Domo. Now, CSS. How does CSS work? Well, it works like this. So the idea is that Domo gives you like 80% of the stuff that you would get, that you would want from something like a less or a SAS or a CSS precompiler, right? And it does it like this. Okay, so I'm actually not, this API is going to evolve, so don't get married to this. But, um, but the idea is that there is, just like there is a document object model that serializes into HTML, there is a CSS object model. It's a W3 stand, three, W3C standard that serializes into CSS, okay? And so eventually, I just want to have a way of, you give it just a, this CSS OM, which is representable in JSON or whatever, any JavaScript, uh, and then we'll serialize it into a, into a style sheet for you. So, uh, so here you go. Uh, so style, that's just a regular style tag. Uh, and you can do on, and on a selector, have a block, okay? So this, you can say the inner HTML, that's actually what gets rendered when you run this code. Not very exciting. Straight up, whatever. Uh, now here's a more interesting example, because now we're doing two things. First, we're using variables, and they're just JavaScript variables. There's no magic here. And the second is we're using a mix-in for rounded corner support. So the idea is, and uh, so you can see, for example, return border radius, WebKit border radius, all that stuff, right? So uh, we can write that in camel case, and Domo will automatically hyphenate it for us. So when we actually put it in the DOM, it's actually hyphenated. Uh, but because camel case is, you don't have to quote it. It's easier to write. It automatically converts that for you. Uh, and then, yeah, style tag, and then two things. And so, like, this one's color gray, color blue. This one has a different rounded corner and uses math, and there's no magic math. This is just JavaScript. Uh, that's kind of cool. And so you can actually also do nesting. So if you look at these two things are actually identical. One is A with an image inside of it, right? And the second one is defining them in, uh, in parallel. Does that make sense? So the idea is then here's another thing. You can just nest. Uh, and so, okay, so we got uh, op um, functions, variables, and mix-ins for free. The CSS code in Domo right now is literally like 200 bytes mini-zipped. It's not a lot, so it's not huge, right? And so like by solving this problem a little bit more elegantly, uh, I think it buys us a lot of flexibility, which is pretty cool. So you can see this, uh, the mix-in actually being used right here. Uh, can you see the mixin being used? Actually, no, I'm sorry. The mixin's only defined there, but it's being used. Anyway, that's how you write CSS and Domo, okay? And so all these things, you write JavaScript, and it goes straight to the DOM. It doesn't serialize. It goes straight to the DOM. Um, and so it, a, a lot of the overhead of, uh, of writing a client-side web app is gone. So here's the trade-off. So here's the pitch. If we are willing to let go of the service syntax of HTML and CSS, here's what we get. 
Okay. We can reduce our exposure to cross-site scripting attacks, which is cool. So here's the thing. HTML, when you're doing user-generated content, users could put anything in there. And if you put that in your HTML and enter HTML that, you could be in a lot of trouble, right? But when you're using DOM methods, they automatically ex escape everything for you. So all these template engines ship with an I like this thing, escape this, this thing, escape that. You don't have to do any of that because the DOM does it for you. When you go document.create text node and you put a string in there, that string gets escaped, okay? So you don't have to do any of that stuff, which is really nice. So this, this makes it easier. We don't do, uh, XSS is, uh, is a lot harder because we're doing our escaping at the JSON level, not at the HTML slash JavaScript level, which is very helpful. Uh, we can eliminate a separate compile step. This is really cool. So this stuff renders in the browser really, really fast. It's strings, mostly. Um, so it renders very fast, which is really nice. Uh, and so you can have a separate compile step. Like if you don't want to compile the CSS in the browser every single time, you can just compile it on the server and send it down through a link tag, right? It's your choice, right? It's going to be the same thing anyway. But the idea is that uh, you get to decide where you do that. So you don't have to have a separate compile step unless you want to optimize and have one, right? And the cool thing is, the reason why this is easier is because we don't need to put a parser because we already have a parser. We already have JavaScript. Does that make sense? So usually, if you use Lesser SAS, like they have or CoffeeScript or anything like this, you can actually put a parser in the browser for all of them. And it's always crazy slow because parsers are slow, right? So by writing a language that's already parsed anyway, uh, we can actually avoid that altogether. We can write our DOM code where it makes sense. Uh, if you guys write backbone apps, uh, you do like a view and it comes with like uh, an element and like you're like, okay, cool. And then you like enter HTML something in that element. And then you're like, okay, actually I want a template for this. Once you want a template, it just gets really, really complicated because then you have to have script tags that have like text in them and you have to like render them. And then, well, you shouldn't really do it in the client because it's slow. You got to render on the server, but then you have a compile step. And so you can, with this, because it's all just JavaScript, you just put your DOM code where it makes sense to you. If you want to separate it for separations of concern because you have designers or whatever, totally do that. It's totally easy. Uh, but the idea is that you kind of j you choose. You can use JavaScript syntax everywhere since we already know all of it. There's no secret symbols to learn. Uh, you can decouple your syntax sugar because you can use CoffeeScript or whatever you want. That's really nice. So if you want to use straight up JavaScript, awesome. Uh, we don't put any style choices or uh, impose any style choices. You can reduce the number of moving parts. So instead of having this thing where you have strings that get compiled into things, it, can be, it goes straight from JavaScript to DOM. So uh, it, you can really reduce the number of moving parts and you can reuse existing infrastructure, which is nice. So like, when you think about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, JavaScript is getting the most attention because people are competing on JavaScript. You know, people, V8 is, is competing, the, all these people are competing on JavaScript. And so, Think about things like source maps. Like, so we have source maps for JavaScript. Well, there's no reason why you couldn't use a source map for your coffee script uh, style sheets. Does that make sense? You can just reuse that infrastructure. If you have an infrastructure for minification, it's the same one. You don't need a CSS minifier too. You just minify your JavaScript and then send it down. Um, so anyway, you can uh, all all this stuff. You you just like unify on kind of one infrastructure by using the same in, uh, syntax. The last thing is you lessen the burden of context switching. Now this is big for me because my career until this year was context switching. It was literally Japanese English, Japanese English, Japanese English, and so like. I am much more effective dealing with one language. Uh, and so the idea of this is that there's only one syntax. You don't have to duck back and forth between two languages. And so I think it makes writing apps, you know, you can one page everything if you want to, or you can split it out uh, if you want to, but it's your choice. Uh, and the context of having things in different files and different kind of escaping mechanisms doesn't exist anymore. So that is the pitch. So thank you guys for having me.